Welcome to CNBC's Healthy Returns, featuring the most influential voices in healthcare. Today, Operation Warp Speed's Monsef Slawi with the latest on the COVID vaccine rollout. CNBC's Healthy Returns live stream is sponsored by Change Healthcare. Now, here's Meg Terrell. Welcome back, everybody, and thanks for sticking with us for this very special Healthy Returns live stream. This, of course, has been the series throughout this year where we've talked with public health experts, researchers, the people who are helping us understand and get through this pandemic. I'm Meg Terrell, CNBC's senior health and science reporter. And our guest now is Dr. Monsef Slawi, chief scientific advisor to Operation Warp Speed. And one of the major reasons we are talking about records being shattered in modern medical history for the speed with which these vaccines for this pandemic have been developed. Dr. Slawi, thanks for being here. Hi, Meg, thanks for having me. Well, why don't we start with the news this week? Of course, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is going out across the U.S. From what you're observing, how is the rollout going so far? Well, touch wood, up to now, it's going, frankly, very well. Uh, the distribution has now taken place to all 636 uh, locations that we had identified and that were given to us by the states. Uh, there have been reports of very small damages to the to the boxes uh, and things like that, but not a single vial of vaccine uh, lost or destroyed. Uh, you may have heard this morning in our press briefing that there were two uh, pizza boxes, as we call them, of 975 uh, doses of vaccine that, that had a, a temperature excursion downwards, uh, colder than minus 80 Celsius, minus 92. Uh, which have been returned and are being assessed uh, within Pfizer to make sure that they're, whether they're okay or not. Uh, other, other than that event, frankly, up to now, it's been excellent. And I would say on the, uh, on the emotional side of things, seeing people being vaccinated, seeing the emotions that people were expressing, and also seeing the recent polls suggesting that there is a much higher or improving um, acceptance of vaccination in the population, some of them even suggesting 70 or 80 percent of people now saying they they would uh, consider taking the vaccine. I think it's very heartwarming and and promising for the future. So up to now, going well. Hmm. Well, I think one of my favorite videos from the first day was seeing those healthcare workers in Boston literally dancing in the street at getting these these vaccines and vaccinations to help you know really end this pandemic. Um, I want to ask you about the challenges of this vaccination campaign that we're now embarking upon. Are we actually able at the last mile level to administer this vaccine to so many people, millions of people so quickly? So, you know, the, the benchmark we have, frankly, is the flu vaccination once a year, 80 million to 100 million vaccine doses distributed and injected in a period of uh, probably five to six months. Uh, so here we're talking about uh, a double to triple that. I think it is within reason to say that it's an achievable objective. There is a, such a level of awareness, such a level of uh, motivation uh, and commitment and resilience in the system that uh, you know, our expectation and our hope is that it's it is going to work. I'm sure. I'm sure, Meg. There will be uh, instances where people were expecting to be vaccinated and and they had to come the next day or or things like that. Uh, 
but I think we need to look at the 90% of the story at the same time as we look at 10% or 5% or I hope only 1% of the story. Uh, mm. But, you know, it's never been done. Uh, so clearly there is a first time and the key assumption we made was let's not invent something that's never been tested. Let's use all the path that's been tested every year uh, and uh, let's enhance it rather than invent something else. And I think that's a reasonable approach that minimizes mm. the risk. What does this start to look like for Americans as more vaccine becomes available? Give us your expectations for the timing of when different groups will be able to get access and when the general population will be able to. And then what does that vaccination campaign look like? I mean, here in New Jersey, I've heard from my county already, I'll be getting my vaccine in a Kmart in, in uh, you know, the nearby town. It's an empty big you know, building. So what is this going to look like for everybody? So, I mean, it may very much depend from one state to the other since the, 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 you know, the definition exactly. But, but I, I would say the following. First, I think there will be people for whom vaccine comes to them and people that go to the vaccine. And in the highest risk population, vaccine is going to be coming to them, whether it's the healthcare workers, whether it's people who are living in long-term care facilities, whether it's a whole series of first-line workers. I think those people will have vaccine coming to them. That's compatible also with mass vaccination strategies. And that those, are, those will be the, the, the first flavors, I would say, as a majority of people uh, immunized. Uh, as you know, those categories of people, if I add to them the people who are over the, over the age of 65, represent about 120 million people in our population. And our plans mm -hmm. is to be able to immunize 100 million of these people with two doses of vaccine uh, by the, the, the end of the first uh, quarter of the year 2021, somewhere during the month of March. And I say somewhere during the month of March because in the second half of February and and in March, we will have a third vaccine, we hope, based on our plans and, and, and how they're progressing up to now, we will have a third vaccine, the Janssen's vaccine, that's a one-shot vaccine. And, and if it is effective and if it is approved, it, it will help us accelerate even faster uh, the, the coverage of that full population. I think during that same period, maybe as of the month of February, uh, some vaccine doses will start to be available uh, or, or maybe even earlier, but in a significant numbers in February, uh, will become available in the CVS and Walgreen, where people will be, I assume, asked to go and get vaccinated. And people, for instance, pe people that are over the age of 65, that are living on their, you know, on their own uh, independ independence, and uh, and then in the second quarter of the year 2021. Uh, mass vaccination of the general population can start. And a, a very important point there is actually if, if one subtracts the 70 to 80 million people who are below the age of 18 in the United States, and let's say more or less the 20 million people that unfortunately may decide not to be vaccinated for whatever reason, either because it's counterindicated or because they have decided they don't want to be vaccinated. We're talking about immunizing 220 or 230 million people, of which 120 are the, the high risk population and 100 million are, are the next much lower risk adult population. I think that population will definitely go through in the, in the month of April and May. And then it's going to depend when, uh, you know, beyond the age 16 to 18, when the uh, trials that have started, the first one started today or yesterday evening, uh, for instance, uh, Moderna trial, uh, uh, driving the age down into the adolescent population to the age of 12 and then the age of five and then the age of a uh, toddler. Uh, and those may come in May, but they may, may but the data may come, you know, gradually between the month of May and the month of September to go all the way down into the ages. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you also about oh, yeah. sort of cadence of supply within this month. You know, we've heard you say there will be enough for 20 million people by the end of December. And, you know, also talking about 40 million doses being available by the end of December. But just looking at the math that's happened so far, 2.9 million doses from Pfizer and BioNTech went out this week. If Moderna gets clearance, 
almost 6 million of Moderna's vaccine will go out next week. I think I heard General Perna today say 2 million of Pfizer's doses will also go out next week. That only gets us to around 11 million doses with one week left of December. Are we going to make the 20 million people or 40 million doses? So the plans is for Moderna, as Moderna expressed, to have 20 million doses, uh, which we know are already produced and filled. This is why the level of confidence is much higher. It's a matter of the last, the last step in the quality control criteria, which is the longest pole in the tent, which is a sterility test. Um, so of course, until that test is available, you cannot use the, the, the vials, but that those vaccines are physically here and, and, uh, and exist 20 million doses. Pfizer, there, it's a little variable uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 or 17 million doses. It's really going to depend really by the day on how batches are released. And that's, this is a, frankly one of the challenges around communicating the number of doses. The way we look at it here internally is as a cadence. Of if I take if I take for instance Moderna, uh, where we have a much more granular visibility on the manufacturing uh, output uh, as compared to to Pfizer, the the you can calculate more or less that every day, more or less a million doses of vaccines are produced and then fill, filled and finished and then quality control released. When you are very early into the process, you know, you're, you're, you know, the first day was a million and a half dose today, and then it was 0.4 million doses tomorrow, and then it was 1.3 million doses day after, etc. But as you get into a cadence, and we express it in weeks, we say, okay, well, it's about 7 million doses every week, and we will be uh, shipping vaccines once a week, giving, giving um, a forecast and a plan to, to each one of the states. And some weeks we may have 7.3 million doses and the next week we may have 6.4 million doses, but you adjust your, your cadence to really give a reasonably constant number of vaccine doses. And after, frankly, after three or four weeks, that cadence will have set itself and our capacity to predict with much higher precision uh, the number of doses that's coming out Will be uh, will be much higher. But what's happening here is the world is discovering with us together how manufacturing of, of a very complex product happens. Which is, you know, you you ramp up, scale up. We couldn't create a stock before starting to use this vaccine because it would be unethical to hold it back. So we're gonna frankly learn this together, and we are giving numbers that are highly thought through somewhat risk adjusted uh, and then we will be transparent about what happens with them some some months we may have a little bit more and some months we may have a little bit less so that last week of december do you think it's going to make up that difference with the the 40 million doses or are we just saying should we stick with 20 million people getting their first shot in december i guess is the question i mean honestly uh, listen until last week uh, the the commitments from the company from the companies were slightly more than 20 million for Pfizer and slightly less than 20 million for Moderna. Now it's 20 or slightly more for Moderna and a little bit less than 20 for Pfizer. And that's what I'm saying is like, as, as we go on a daily basis, batches are made, filled, released. Uh, uh, so the plan is for 40, probably now the plan is for 37. But yes, you're right. The key point, which is frankly my preference, is to talk about people immunized because that's what counts. Uh, right. We can immunize a million people by the end of this month and give them a second dose within the month of January, as well as immunize another 20 to 30 million people, 30 million people in the month of January with their first dose. Well, a key question for you, uh, this comes from Mark C, um, who submitted it via Twitter. And I know you've been asked this a lot. I know I hear this a lot, but I think a lot of people are still very curious to hear your thoughts on it. And I bet you even know what it's going to be. Um, he asks if I can ask you if you consider sending all the Moderna vaccine out now uh, with uh, no second dose holdback in light of the 92% first dose efficacy at 
14 plus days. He notes 225,000 new daily infections indicate as much vaccine as possible needs to be pushed now. Well, here is here is the, the challenge with that. For, first, of course, we've been asked the question. And first, we, of course, spent very significant time modeling what could happen and the various consequences. So the first thing to really realize is we don't have 20 million doses. We have 7 million this week and 7 million next week and 5 million the week after. And therefore, deciding to give a first, to give all the doses produced on an ongoing basis. That's the key, on a rolling ongoing basis to, to always to new subjects, so to, to new individuals, by definition means, by definition means we omit to give them the second dose as a decision. I personally have a big problem with that. We have spent seven months explaining to the US population that we have developed these vaccines according to the best science and the best regulatory requirements possible. What would be the first thing we do as soon as we have them is we use them completely in the dark of knowledge of what happens after day 28 or day 21 after one dose, because that's the reality. We know that we have indeed amazing efficacy between day 14 and day 21 in Pfizer and between day 14 and day 28 with Moderna but I can't guarantee you that that efficacy will still be there on day 37 or day 52. And if we knowingly claim and tell people you are immune now when they aren't, because we don't know, they may be, but they may not be. I think that would be not responsible and that could be actually dangerous. This is the number one thing. The second thing is that because we're using every single vaccine those used, the only way is going to be at some moment, we're going to have to stop vaccinating anybody and start giving the second dose to those people, right? And imagine we take eight weeks of immunization without giving a second dose. After week eight, week eight after eight more weeks, we should be not immunizing anybody. We should just giving a second dose to everyone that we gave a first dose to. So when we did that calculation, you realize that you can't do it that way. That would be really, I think, not responsible. You could imagine to play a week. And if you play a week, the complexity, the complexity that you create into the system to gain, and we frankly model it and ended up saying between one, one and two million people would benefit uh, uh, from vaccination probably a month or a month and a half earlier than planned. But you run the risk of A, wrongly suggesting to people that it's okay not to get your second dose or suggest to people that we break the rules of how you should use the vaccine on day one or god forbid if there are manufacturing challenges which we can't predict you can put people at a longer risk of of having an incomplete immune response uh, mm. so this is this is it's a difficult decision, but honestly, I think it's, yeah. I, I do think it's the right decision. And uh, what we are working very hard on is to make sure the Janssen's vaccine comes to the rescue. And then hopefully also the AZ vaccine comes to the rescue as humanly fastly as possible to supplement well, the immunization. And the, the key yeah. Well, I know I, there's so much, I have so much curiosity about those two, but I, I want to ask you, you know, sort of hoping that those will turn out to be, you know, at, effective enough to, to, to join the, the supply. But right now we know Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines work. They're safe. Moderna should be on the, the market soon too. But with Pfizer, if you can clarify for us, because there's been conflicting information out there in public statements. You know, Dr. Scott Gottlieb was on CNBC last week and again on Monday, and he said the last offer Pfizer made to the U.S. government to sell its second quarter allotment of doses was in November um, you know, after the efficacy data. And I know you were asked about this this morning in the Operation Warp Speed briefing, and you suggested that you hadn't seen the efficacy data when the, when they offered you the doses. Can you just set the record straight for us? Yes, I said two things. I said first that previous uh, uh, offers is a, is a very big word. Phone conversation saying, we need to, we're gonna commit vaccine to other countries are you sure you don't want them? Happened in August, happened in September, and frankly, 
before the first analysis of the data, there is no way we should do it. I, I don't think it would be responsible to do it because you don't know, you don't know which vaccine you should acquire. After that, timing becomes very important. Knowing that, yes, we would like to have another 100 million doses, but we want to have them in the second quarter of the year 2021. And, you know, to be very blunt, we wouldn't be having all this conversation if the, the real point into the story, Mac, frankly, is that Pfizer needs very significant, more intense help than it, Pfizer was having because we were helping Pfizer, but under conditions that wouldn't create a, 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 a reach of the government into Pfizer. I mean, for, if we have, for instance, to use a, a DPAS, a, you know, a Defense Production uh, Act. Act, Production Act, yeah, you know, th that comes with consequences uh, to prioritize access to raw material, etc. You know, once, you know, under normal conditions, we did not have a, uh, an assurance that we would have vaccine doses in the second quarter of the year 2021. And as I said this morning, it's useless, frankly, to have vaccine doses in, in the month of September or in the month of December. So the conversation was there. And what we are observing, and frankly, this would all be normal discussions outside of having to have them in the media, is to say, we need help on the one hand, and we say, yes, and we need vaccine doses. Let's sit together and work this out. We're going to help you to the maximum, and you're going to make the vaccine doses that we need. And that's how life is, and that's what's happening. And as I said, we're very confident that we we will come to a conclusion that's a very constructive conclusion and have more vaccine doses for the American people. Is it complicated at all by the, the fact that the... Yeah, the, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are both mRNA vaccines. They're different, but is there overlap in the supplies that they need? And, and does that complicate your ability to use the Defense Production Act to prioritize materials to one or the other? No, we don't. Uh, that's the, 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 the point. We never did. And, uh, the, you know, uh, we lived with five companies that's beyond messenger RNA all the vaccine product use the same things. Vessels, tubes, vials, syringes, chemicals, you name it. You know, messenger RNA is one element into the equation, right? And that's, uh, people need to really realize that. And what we, we have done is really a very thorough job to optimize the portfolio of Operation Warp Speed and make sure no company is advantaged in one way or, or the other. What happened with Pfizer is Pfizer did not want that kind of help. Actively said, no, I don't want it, right? And therefore, we couldn't have them part of that equation. And now they actively want it. So that's very good. I think, I mean, so I, we should I don't expect think there's any you would be using the Defense Production Act to help Pfizer and, and perhaps we would see a deal struck in the second quarter to deliver doses soon? That's the requirement. I mean, I, I don't think the U.S. government should prioritize manufacturing of vaccine doses for Japan against vaccine doses for the U.S. I think that's reasonable. I think they should. I, I would agree with that. If, if the U.S. government is paying for it and prioritizing, it should prioritize the vaccine, the physical doses that will come to the U.S. population first. And then once that is served, prioritize the physical doses that go to other people in the world. And that's what we're doing. I mean, the, uh, the R&D work, the manufacturing process set up, the manufacturing facilities, those are all things that are there that will be useful for the global world. But I think the expectation of the US people is that we prioritize first immunizing the US people. And therefore, we, we need to prioritize first the materials that will go to manufacture vaccines for the US people. I think that's, mm. I think it's fair. Now, not that, that if it is sorry, if it is limiting, Max. Sorry, just to make sure I, I what I'm saying. If a product is limiting, then we would need to prioritize for the U.S. people. If a product is not limiting, of course we would not blindly say, "Oh, only I, we only care about the U.S. people. We don't care about any anybody else." Just want to make sure. Right. 
I'm talking well, about that particular this, you know. Yeah, it was on Squawk Box with us on Monday morning. And he did note that there were some supplies running at critical levels. He didn't say which ones they were. But from what you, you just mentioned, you know, the idea of prioritizing the U.S. population over other countries like Japan, uh, in order, does that mean in order for the U.S. to help with the Defense Production Act, prioritizing materials getting to Pfizer, would it need to break um, supply agreements it's already made with other countries? No, no, that not at all. I think it's actually, that's why I always talk about enhancing capacity and increasing capacity. That's really what we're discussing and, the, and that's what the objective is. I understand. Okay, I've asked you a million questions on that. I want to ask you about the Moderna uh, Advisory Committee meeting tomorrow and some really surprising data we saw come out in the documents uh, from Moderna about prevention of asymptomatic infection. That seems to suggest this vaccine could prevent transmission. Um, tell us about the data and how much we can read into that at this point. Well, it's early data. It's preliminary data. It's data that were taken at day 28 uh, in, in the subject immunized. And it has shown a clear imbalance between placebo and vaccine that equates to 65 something percent. Uh, prevention of infection as detected by PCR in people who didn't have any symptoms. So this is clearly uh, asymptomatic infection. I think that data will be, is very encouraging. Again, is short-term protection, remember, it's just for, you know, up to day 28. In fact, it's a snapshot, right? Oh, probably for infections that occurred within a week or 10 days around day 28, before day 28, and they were carrying over. Uh, one area by which, one approach by which we are going to be testing, I would say more completely, uh, although it has this limitation, I'll tell them in a second, but more completely the, uh, the eff efficacy against infection is, uh, we will be testing in the serum of all the subjects vaccinated the presence of antibodies against vaccine against uh, proteins from the virus that are not in the vaccine and people who would have gotten infected <coughs> and were asymptomatic uh, would normally have an immune response against those proteins and therefore we, we will be able to assess how effective the vaccination has been against prevention of infection the limitation i think the data will be very important and uh, the 65% efficacy for the PCR test is, is very encouraging in, in relation to that data. The limitation of the, of the data on prevention of infection as tested by seroconversion to non-vaccine antigen is that already in normal, the natural history of this infection, and uh, uh, quite a percentage of people who are, who are asymptomatically infected, for instance, do not seroconvert or seroconvert and then the antibodies wane very quickly. And it's possible that in the face of vaccine immune response that probably already further decreases the load of virus, maybe a number of asymptomatic infections that have a very small load of virus will not seroconvert to the non-vaccine antigen. I hope it's clear what I said. So we may we may overestimate estimate the um, the efficacy against asymptomatic infection. In order to to build on the, these early data of prevention of infection, we are in active discussion of designing a clinical trial, <clears throat> for instance, in college students, hmm. where huh. uh, students will be vaccinated. You know, they, they have high uh, low risk of uh, high risk of infection, low risk of disease high risk of transmission, compare a vaccine group to a placebo, it's a study that would need to be done quickly. <coughs> and, uh, and then <clears throat> for those people who come up and on a daily basis with a positive swab, see through a contact tracking uh, strategy, whether they have transmitted the virus, because then we can ask the two questions. A, does the vaccine prevent infection? And B, if it prevents infection or if it lowers the virus load in infected people, does it impact transmission? I, I hope we can mm. put that study together and run it. It will, it will be an important element for the public health impact of the vaccines. Fascinating. I look forward to hearing more about that. I, I know that you have to go, so I'm going to ask one more viewer question and then one more of my own questions. 
This viewer question is from Deval Shah, who asks, in terms of safety, how would you rank the different kinds of vaccines, RNA versus adenovector, uh, and I'll, I'll throw in the protein vaccines there as well. And I wonder if you could also just add in your expectation if there will be differences in the efficacy from these vaccines as well. So if I start with uh, safety first, on the basis of the short to midterm safety profile of the RNA vaccine, uh, 77, 80,000 subjects, if I combine the Moderna and the Pfizer data sets, that data doesn't look different from a recombinant protein-based adjuvanted vaccine. Uh, so, you know, really the injection site and the systemic events associated with the immunization itself, so they are within 24, 36 hours of immunization. Other than that, there is nothing remarkable. That's very similar if I take older population to Shingrix vaccine that has an adjuvant in it, and I expect it as very similar, for instance, or slightly more higher percentage of, of uh, uh, pain in the injection site than, than vaccines using uh, also novel adjuvant, uh, whether they are flu uh, vaccine, for instance, or, or HPV vaccine. If I, uh, the unknown, which is an unknown, but we know that the midterm safety is a predictor of the very long-term safety, is the very long-term safety. And that we will learn as the pharmacovigilance observations will, will, will teach us and show us. And those are going to be super important. <clears throat> I think the, uh, the uh, so on that basis, I rank messenger RNA similar and equivalent to the uh, protein vaccine. If I take the live vector vaccine, it's very important to know that these viruses are replication defective. And therefore, they actually don't, they don't um, amplify themselves when they are injected. They, they really, they are literally like a cargo plane. They deliver the DNA <coughs> that encodes the protein of, of the COVID-19 virus uh, to help us get immunized with it. They're, at the doses used, their systemic reactogenicity in the short term, 24, 36 hours, is slightly higher than that of the messenger RNA and that of the uh, adjuvant protein vaccine, slightly more chill, slightly more fever, mostly in the younger age group, same as, as, as the RNA vaccine and the same as the protein vaccine, less in the higher age group. Otherwise, nothing remarkable, less pain in the injection site. <coughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and then the adjuvanted protein vaccine, uh, one of the adjuvant I know very well, the AS3 adjuvant used part of the GSK and Sanofi vaccine. Again, a very safe adjuvant in terms of serious adverse events uh, and an adjuvant that uh, incurs uh, 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 pain at the injection site, redness in duration and chills, uh, some fever again, 24, 36 hours. So honestly, I would rank the, the three platforms substantially similarly with the live vectors having slightly less local reaction in the injection site and slightly more systemic reaction. And all of that is within 24, 36 hours. On the efficacy side of things, I'm impressed with the messenger RNA vaccine efficacy, really impressed. I, but that level of impressed was already started at my time uh, on the Moderna board and chairing their uh, R and D committee, it's it's really it's really a new platform for vaccines, and uh, it's very impressive. The level of immune response induced, uh, particularly in the elderly population, and I think a lot of that is actually thanks to the formulation of of the messenger RNA that plays in a way an important role in in allowing the messenger RNA to get into the cells and in helping the immune response to, uh, to be an excellent one. I think I expect the protein vaccines to be very good. The early data from the two protein vaccines are um, 
coming out. Those from Sanofi GSK uh, are less than we hoped for, principally as, as in press release, because the, the dose uh, wasn't, we needed to go higher on the dose and higher on purity. Those from Novavax are excellent. Uh, and, um, and I expect those from Sanofi to be excellent when the right dose uh, gets there. <clears throat> I think the immunogenicity of the uh, Janssen's vaccine as a two-dose vaccine is excellent. I think it's so good that we thought this vaccine could go as a one-dose vaccine because one of the characteristics of, of this vaccine platform compared to the others is that the immune response continues to go up after the first dose, even if you don't give a second dose for a much mm -hmm. longer period than with the other vaccines. And that's one, one of the reasons we, uh, we decided to, uh, to, to take it forward. And uh, I can't say the same for the AZ just because we don't have that, that uh, uh, data over time, kinetically. Uh, but but it, should be, it should be similar. I think there, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the level, the, the work done, principally through Oxford University, uh, has, could have benefited from a more industrial setting. Uh, uh, but now AZ is, is providing that, and we we think the the, the, tri the phase three trial we're running here in the US will give us a definitive answer as to the performance of that vaccine. Sorry, long answer, well, but that's a lot to cover. Basically, the work you've been doing since May. Um, well, my last question for you is, you know, a lot of folks say that seeing the people who worked on these vaccines receive them will boost confidence. Uh, when can we expect to see you get your shot, and which one are you going to get? So uh, I absolutely commit to get the vaccine in public. Uh, I'm struggling and any advice people can give me uh, is very welcome. I don't want to go ahead of the line and be told you're taking advantage. And I don't want to go in the back of the line and be told, you know, you don't believe in it. Frankly, I need help. <laughs> and uh, somebody tells me, I mean, I, I want to do the right thing. My objective is to take this vaccine. But you see my point. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take the vaccine that happens to be coming out just to show you how much I trust all of them. Whatever vaccine happens, when I'm told this is the right balance between speed of getting the vaccine and showing that it's the right vaccine, or showing that you take it too, I'll take that vaccine. If it's the Pfizer, it's Pfizer. If it's Moderna, it's Moderna. If it's Janssen, it's Janssen. I'm 61, so I should get vaccinated, not too long from now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be watching. Dr. Slawi, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. All right, and thank you to everybody out there for watching another one of our Healthy Returns live streams. And this is our last one for 2020, which I can't believe we're at the end of December, but we'll be back next year as we continue to talk to the most influential figures in healthcare. Join us on February 9th for our Healthy Return Spotlight, Prognosis for Recovery. You can register now at cnbcevents.com. Until then, everybody stay well, and we'll see you next time.